One thing you might be wondering, you might be saying, well, okay, you know, how likely is it, though, that 7.5% will be achieved? Because we, we could get lucky. I mean, things could really just be okay if these funds happen to get 7.5% returns. It's still a fraudulent disclosure to assume that they're going to when we know that they're not going, when we know that they're, they're unlikely to or they're not guaranteed to. Do they have to pay the pension no matter what? It's not like a 401k in, in, in these retirement plans that you guys are going to have. You know, you can invest in risky assets, but if the risky assets don't do well, you're going to have to spend less money in your retirement. That's not how it works with these cities and states. If the investments that they make don't do well, they still owe the pensions that they have promised. How likely is it that a 7.5% return will be achieved? Well, if you invest in safe securities nowadays, like government bonds, you're getting a... Uh, around a one and a half, one and three quarters percent per year return. So to get seven and a half percent, you're going to have to invest the rest of it in some really risky securities. Maybe the stock market will help. Private equity, hedge funds, other things. And you better really hope that those things are going to deliver. Uh, there are a bunch of financial models. If I crunch the numbers, I would say that there may be a 25 percent chance of a seven and a half percent return happening over the next 30 years, maybe. Um, we're going to have to probably have a lot of inflation in, uh, uh, in consumer prices as well for that to happen. Um, but we're in an environment now where bond yields are low and stocks are expensive. So it's probably even less likely than a 25% chance. I and mean, when you bond safe securities are yielding 1.5% and the stock, this is the price earnings ratio of the stock market for anybody who's steeped in finance, you know, that's like over, you know, over 30. Uh, it, studies have shown that it's just very unlikely that you're going to achieve high returns in this kind of environment. So it's not even very, not even very likely. Um, they've, they've risked up a lot. Uh, taken, they're taking on a lot more risk than they ever were before. This graph shows uh, allocations to equities, uh, private equity, uh, hedge funds, other things. So the, the word alternatives means private equity, venture capital, hedge funds, kind of risky private investments. It used to be back in the 80s that you, know, you could target a 7.5 or 8% return just by investing in safe government bonds. Uh, that's not the way it is anymore. You, uh, you, you can, as I mentioned, safe government bonds, you can get maybe 1.5% or 2% in safe government bonds. So uh, a prudent thing to, to do would have been to scale back one's expectations a bit and say, yeah, we're in a world now where all market signals point to the fact that we're not going to be able to earn anywhere close to 7.5%. Um, but that's not what they do. Instead, they have just rebalanced their portfolio to take on more and more, uh, more, and more risk. And on the right, this shows the uh, allocation of uh, public pension funds to different asset classes today. Equity is uh, the stock market. Alternatives are these you know, private equity, venture, hedge funds, things like that. Real estate, they've, they've only got about a quarter of their portfolios in relatively safe assets. And the difference is that you know, 30 years ago, they had almost all their portfolios in relatively safe assets. 35 years ago, almost all of it in relatively safe assets. And now they're basically just trying to uh, gamble for resurrection because a lot of these funds are really underwater with their, with their promises. How underwater are they? How large are these debts? Well, the, the principle for measurement here that's used in, uh, it's used in private sector accounting it's used in, when companies sponsor these plans. It's also used internationally. So when I travel internationally and talk about the US standards for these pension plans and the dangers to the municipal bond market as a result of it, uh, people uh, in, in, in finance in Europe, for example, they can't believe that we do it this way. I mean, they just cannot believe the state and local governments are allowed to, uh, to use this kind of flawed accounting. So uh, uh, because a pension is a promise to pay an employee a certain pre-specified amount, it is like a government bond. And to measure the cost of delivering on the promise, we have to consider the interest rate on very safe bonds. You can, uh, you can ask any insurance company that sells annuities to, uh, uh, to you know, measure for you what is the cost of promising somebody that you're going to pay them you know, $50,000 every year from the time they retire until the time they die. An insurance company will quote you a cost for that. And they're not going to quote you a cost based on some crazy assumption that they're going to earn 8% returns in their assets. They're going to quote you a cost that's based on the yields on safe bonds because they're matching a safe promise. They may decide to speculate in some ways. They may decide to speculate and hope to meet this promise by taking some risk to the extent that they're allowed to. But to measure the cost, they've got to use those yields. It doesn't matter that the assets could be invested in equity, private equity, hedge funds. The pensions have got to be, made, have got to be paid um, no matter what. Okay, so um, here are uh, the state's discount rates that they used uh, for their disclosures in 2016. They used a seven and a, roughly 7.5% uh, return assumption. 
Um, the average treasury yield in 2016 would have been the right number to use then, which is 2.7%. These promises, this is where we're asking, what is the cost of delivering on a promise that you know you're going to have to make, that you're not going to default on? Um, I mentioned Detroit a few minutes ago, right? Detroit had a bankruptcy where they, uh, the bank bankruptcy is when you declare that you are unable to meet all of your obligations, meet all of your financial obligations. And Detroit had a lot of different financial obligations to a lot of different investors, a lot of different entities. They had big financial obligations to people who had bought their government bonds, who had invested in their, in their securities. They also had massive financial obligations to their public employees, to their public safety officials, to the teachers in their public schools, and so on. In that bankruptcy, you know, who, who's, uh, who lost more in that bankruptcy? The people who had bought, bought bonds from the, from the city or the people who had worked for the city? Do you know who lost most? It was the people who had bought bonds from the city. They, if you, bought, if you, if you, if you uh, had invested $1 in a Detroit bond, you got 10 cents on average as a result of this bankruptcy. That's what happens if you buy, buy the debt of you know, a city or state that goes bankrupt, you're going to lose most of your money. The, uh, the pensions of the public employees were preserved. They may, there may, I think there was a 1% reduction in the cost of living adjustment. You know, these pensions have, if you retire and your initial number is 100,000, uh, they'll raise it each year along with uh, the cost of living, with uh, uh, the, the consumer price index. And they kind of shaded it a little bit, so they said we're going to do consumer price index minus 1%. So they lost, the, the public employees in that sense who retired, they lost a little bit, but the, ca the calculations, they lost about 4% of what they were owed, whereas creditors lost 90% of what they're owed. So this is like a really, really safe form, a really safe government promise. And to measure the cost of providing a safe government promise that you can't default on, you've got to use some much lower number. So you know, we use around 2 and 3 quarters uh, uh, percent. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is that you, uh, you may not have known this, but you owe $3.8 trillion, you, to, to public employees. You didn't know that this was happening because the government accounts were fraudulent. But uh, you owe $3.8 trillion to state local government employees above and beyond the monies that have already been set aside. So, uh, so that's kind of unfortunate, particularly in light of the fact that the cities and states have been claiming all along that, uh, that, that they're running balanced budgets, right? Because they've been able to use this, this fraudulent accounting. I've been working on this for quite a long time. I don't know, maybe now about 12 years now. And um, uh, finally now the Federal Reserve in their, in their uh, fall 2018, it's called the flow of funds, their reports, they now are publishing numbers where they are adjusting the state and local uh, unfunded liability uh, measures to, to reflect financial accounting. So they, they also now report a total that's very consistent with the total that, uh, that we find, over four trillion actually is what the Federal Reserve is now reporting. So it took a very long time, but now we're sort of finally there, we've woken up and now we've realized that we've all, we all have uh, this, uh, this debt to, uh, to public employees. That's going to that's gonna be a lot, you know, uh, uh, given the 125 million uh, uh, households out there uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, you're looking at, you know, $30,000 per, per U.S. household of debts to, unfunded debts to public employees. So it's too bad. It's different across uh, many states. So some of the worst states, you can look at our reports and, you know, Illinois, Ohio, Louisiana, Kentucky, these are some of the states that are in the worst shape. Um, this, is a, this is one measure. There are different ways of measuring this. This is the... Uh, a number of years of tax revenue you would have to devote entirely just to paying down, uh, to paying pension obligations if you wanted to get, get rid of this problem. So, uh, you know, so in Illinois, it's like eight and a half years. You'd have to take eight and a half years of tax revenue just devoted to, 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 to pensions, 100% uh, of the pensions. Already about a quarter of Illinois state revenues are going to, uh, uh, to pension contributions, and it's not even enough to uh, prevent the state from sliding into uh, into a financial crisis. Here, here is Illinois. Uh, uh, they've got, uh, you know, they, they actually do have bonds. Illinois is a funny place because they, um, uh, while they do have one of these balanced budget requirements, they're also, they've allowed themselves to claim that they're running a balanced budget by issuing bonds as well, which is kind of a strange thing. I mean, it would be like saying, I, my, my household, we're running a balanced budget. We're racking up, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year of credit card debt, but we, we define balanced budget to make that okay. Uh, that's kind of what they're doing. So they have about $150 billion of just general obligation debt, and they have, but they have about $350 billion of these unfunded promises to public employees. And as I mentioned, you know, if the state goes into financial distress, and is unable to meet its obligations, 
you know, imagine what's going to happen if the state tries to cut pensions to public employees. It's, it's not, it's not going to work, first of all. It might not be fair in a sense that many of these public employees have actually planned their whole lives for these, uh, for these pensions. But also, you know, the state has a constitutional provision that says that pension benefits may not be diminished or impaired. That's, and that, that, that is a very, very clear statement. And it's going to make it very, you know, very difficult if Illinois wanted to try to get out of these promises. They're, they wouldn't even be able to if they, if they wanted to do it. So this is debt that's going to have to be, have to be paid. Plus the fact that it's owed to people who provide essential public services every day. I mean, are you really, is the state really going to try to default on promises that it's made to its police force or its teachers? I mean, it just, it's, it's not going to happen. So, so, uh, so they, are, uh, they are really in, uh, in, in, in deep trouble. And people have even uh, thought about the idea that it's possible that Illinois and some other states could, could face uh, the possibility of a federal bailout, that the federal government might decide to bail them out. It's a, a very controversial uh, statement or idea in Washington, um, you know, so, so was the idea 15 years ago that, that uh, Congress might bail out major financial institutions, you know, like, uh, uh, like Goldman Sachs, right, or, or, uh, or major insurance companies like AIG or, um, uh, you know, large banks. That was also a controversial idea. Nobody, everybody said it will never happen. We'll just let them fail. But when it comes down to it, seems like there's a, a lot of bailout risk that Congress basically says, no, we, we can't let them fail. You know, it's just too many bad things would happen. And this is a similar situation. It's like that. Too many bad things would, uh, would happen if Illinois were, you know, to default on its promises to, uh, you know, to the people who provide public safety or, you know, keep the, keep the peace in the state or who, uh, who teach students. Okay, so what's at stake, right? This, this, is, like, this is what a classroom in Detroit looked like. So, uh, and this is increasingly what, what's happening in Chicago is that uh, the money that is being raised by the city. You know, the first slide we had money that was being raised by cities and states. The money that's being raised is increasingly going to pension contributions and increasingly less to public services like schools. Um, people are very unhappy about this, right? They're, the public employees have planned. They have planned to retire on the basis of these pensions, and it's crowding out public services. This, these are some graphs from. Uh, San Jose, okay, so San Jose recognized, uh, tried to do some, uh, tried to address this issue. This top graph here, you can't really see the axis, but it doesn't matter. The, the, the top line is the budget of the San Jose Police Department. The bottom line, and that, that went up over a period of about, this is a you know, decade, decade and a half period, went up by 40 percent. The, uh, the number of uniformed uh, public safety officials on the street went down by 14 percent. How can that be? Well, it's because the city is having to shovel increasingly more money into the pension fund just to keep it from running out, just to you know, prevent, the, prevent the fund from, from, be, from becoming exhausted. So we end up having a situation where taxpayers are paying more for getting less because the city is not, did not properly plan in the past for, uh, for the promises that they're, that they're making. Um, what can be done? You know, uh, unlike the federal government, states can't print money. And it's also very hard to walk away from these promises. Uh, so uh, essentially, if you ask what can be done, they have to either start getting serious about finding ways of raising revenue to, to pay these defined benefit uh, pensions, or they need to transition towards uh, 401k plans. It's one or the other. They can't just keep running defined benefit plans and uh, pretending that all is going to be okay. That seems to be the, what their, their uh, primary choice has been up till now. You have to choose one or the other. Either you, either you have to be willing to pay for the promise that you're making, uh, or you've got to not make a promise and instead do what the private sector has done. Uh, I want to show you one other set of graphs, actually, that I just really like. This is uh, the uh, percent of total revenue in the states, in these states that are going to uh, going to, to pension contributions. This is a percentage of all state and local governments. And you can see that this isn't maybe so bad, right? You look at this and you say, okay, the worst is Illinois there in the middle, which is somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all state plus local revenue going for all state plus local uh, pension systems. Uh, California is, you know, somewhere in the shaded in the 10 to 15 percent. Doesn't look that bad. But the, the real problem is not how much they're contributing now. Um, the real problem is how much they would have to contribute to stabilize the situation. You know, the example I like to give is, uh, you know, suppose a friend told you, you, you had a chat with your friend, you say, how, how are your finances doing? Yeah, well, they're, they're doing fine. Uh, I only send about 5% of my income to my credit card company. 
that statement tells you nothing about how your friend's finances are, right? It might be that your friend should be you know, sending 30% of his income to the credit. That tells you nothing. So that's like this graph. This is how much they are contributing. This is how much they're sending to the credit card company. This graph here is a lot more heat in this map. This shows you how much they should be contributing just to stabilize the situation, not, to, not for your friend to pay down their credit card debt, but just to prevent the, debt, the credit card debt from increasing. And there you see that there are a lot of states that have to pay uh, substantially more. And every year that they don't do it, Every year that they don't do it, uh, the situation uh, gets worse. Um, so uh, that's my talk. Um, state local governments uh, are organizing the provision of crucial public services, but they've been doing it for decades, assuming that future generations will be able to uh, make up for these unfunded debts. Their main strategy is to sort of try to gamble in financial markets on your behalf. Uh, what to do? I mean, I, what to do is you got to, you know, if you're if you're going to get involved in in, in these issues, you've got to demand that they either have to start paying, they need to find a lot more in the way of revenue sources, if that's, your, if that's your preference, or stop promising. I personally prefer stop promising because I, after all of this, I mean, you know, for, forgive me for being uh, untrusting, but, but if you get, if you get, <laughs> if they've been lying for so long, why would it be that they would just finally now just start to say, okay, now we're going to do this in a prudent way? I'm, I'm very not trusting of state and local governments given this history of their being able to turn around and start paying enough. Um, the alternative is, you know, you're just going to have to get ready for much higher taxes and much worse schools and public safety. I actually see this kind of heading towards, uh, you know, financial crises at the state and local level with some states and cities, uh, you know, Illinois and Chicago being probably at the forefront, um, facing a lot of uh, these kind of financial distress type situations that are going to involve uh, a fair amount of, uh, of uh, unpleasantness in terms of uh, people who rely on public services, uh, or any of us, we all rely on local public services, schools and public safety, uh, to be able to still have quality services uh, without paying extremely high taxes, or, or it may be that the level of taxes that some of these places have to go to is just simply not feasible to, to, uh, to be raised in order to, uh, to make up for these, uh, for these debts.